Sure. That's, I think that's a great question for everybody to get a chance to look at. So and we can certainly, if people have other questions about this handout or if we want to work on it, because I think it's just good practice, we certainly can do that. I have some inverse trig things to say though. So let's see here. Where'd you go? Ah, let's use this other one. Yeah. Sorry, pens, pens, pens. Today is the 20th of February. So this was the question, it's number 19 from this worksheet. And it says, all these are derivatives pretty much. It says your function is f of x equal to x e to the x to the pi power. And just like other constants, three, four, seven, whatever, if you have some stuff to a power, we can use the power. So like if this was x e to the x to the third, the derivative would be three times our stuff squared. And then we'd have to use the chain rule we'll multiplied by the derivative of the steps. Here, it's going to look a little messier, but the idea is still the same. The derivative is going to be, well, the power comes down. Your stuff stays as is. And then our new power is one less than it was before. So we're going to write i minus one. And then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside which we could do as one step, but I'm gonna do as two. So we're gonna rewrite this as pi times x e to the x to the pi minus one. Um, important point here, we shouldn't be writing any decimal approximations, right? This isn't 3.14, this isn't 2.14. They're close to those numbers, but the actual exactly right thing to write is pi and pi minus one. There's no other better way to write this. Times, we're gonna to have to use the product rule here. The derivative of x is one, times leave the e to the x alone, plus now we leave the x alone and the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And that is how we would find the derivative of x e to the x to the pi power. I like that question, it's a good question. Um, while we're looking at it, are there any other specific questions from this handout people would like me to look at that don't have inverse straight functions? Because we haven't talked about it. It's okay if there aren't. I just thought I would see if there's anything that like stuck out to anyone real quick. Okay, I know there were people in the reflections who said that they had some questions about the midterm that McDonough gave Friday, Wednesday, whatever day he gave it. Um, are there specific questions people would like to see addressed? Yes, I know that makes me, I have the midterm in front of me here. So I'm like, so the first page had some derivative stuff. You know what? It's good practice. Let's just go through the most of it. And then, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, for those of you in his class, it's good because you want to maybe see what was happening. For those of you not in his class, it's stuff that's still kind of coming up for you. So I think it's a good, I think it's good for everybody. So let's look at some of these examples or some of these questions. So we want to find the derivative of the following function f of x equals cosine of x minus x over x squared. And the idea here is that we're going to use the quotient rule. So it's going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top. I will point out, you know how we say the derivative, it's like f prime g, but I usually write g times f prime. He did do the same thing in his solutions. Um, he wrote, wow, a lot more than I would ever write for this in his solutions. He wrote like what a u and a v were. I would just say it's the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is negative sine of x minus one, minus the top, cosine of x minus x, times the derivative of the bottom, which is two x, all divided by the denominator squared, which is x to the fourth. You could write x squared squared. I don't think, I think it's a safe uh, simplification there just to write x to the fourth. And if you have questions or comments or observations, I'm like, in my earlier class today, I totally made a huge mistake subtracting something when I should have added it and they totally should have canceled out. So if you see me making a little mistake, speak up right away. It's, it's you're probably, probably not wrong. Let's look at the next one. I guess I could label these. This is from, from McDonald's actual exam. This is 1A. This is 1B. The function here is f of x equal to x to the fifth e to the x minus 4x. The derivative, we're going to have to use the product rule. 
So for x to the fifth, e to the x is going to be 5x to the fourth times e to the x plus x to the fifth times the derivative of e to the x, also known as e to the x, and then minus the derivative of 4x, which is 4. Um, again, I'll just point out, looking at his solutions, right? it's totally fine to do this thing where you write what u and v are, and then what the derivative of u and the derivative of v are. And remember the formula is like u times dv plus v times du. But you don't have to do all that. If you just know how to sit, unless you don't have to, unless your teacher says he wants you to do that, then okay, yeah. I guess you have to for the exam. But I would say it's a perfectly fine to be like, yeah. You might, if you felt worried about it, you might label things as like, this is you. Let me make let me make the same choices. This is you, and this is V, and this is I prefer writing U prime versus DV. And this is U. This is V prime. Not necessary, but totally fine to write. Um, a reminder or a word of warning or caution. Make sure that your U's look round and your V's look sharp so that they're distinguishable from one another. Um, it becomes more important in 21B where we actually kind of use those letters more often. So yeah, make sure your U's and your V's look different. It's easy to make them not look different. Let's look at 1C. For those of you joining us, we're just looking at McDonald's actual exam. The function is f of x equal to x squared plus 2 to the e plus e to the x. The derivative is 2x plus 0 plus e to the x, because 2 to the e is just a constant, and the derivative of a constant is going to be 0. I think this wasn't too terrible. I don't think this is too, too tricky. I think the trickier thing would be if someone gave you like g of x equal to e to the third plus 5x squared, it's real, real easy to convince yourself that the derivative of e to the third is e to the third. It's not. The derivative of e to the third is zero, just like the derivative of two to the e is zero. I don't see any x's there. I don't see any variables there. It's a constant. Its derivative is zero. Plus ten x. Cool. All right. Let's look at question two. Let's do the questions. Always happy to answer questions. I was happy to keep things in order here. All right. Um, question two, it looks like it's some graphing stuff. Uh, yeah, some, no, I guess it's a limit stuff. If you get the following limits using whatever method you would like. If the limit does not exist, write infinity, negative infinity does not exist. Oh, I should also point out. Sorry. Then, yeah. All right, so here we have the limit x approaches 4 from the left of e to the 2x times x minus 10 squared over x minus 4 cubed. And the first thing we should always try with a limit is what? Let's plug it in. See what you get. If I plug in 4, I'm going to get e to the 8th over 4 minus 10 squared over, now the denominator, since I'm going to get a zero, I'm going to be a little more explicit with my zero here. Number slightly less than four, minus four, is slightly positive or negative. Everybody. I guess that hurts the negative, maybe. Right? This not, right? We're approaching four from the left. We're a little smaller than four. We're subtracting four. We're a little bit negative. And then we're getting cubed. So the top is positive, and a negative number to an odd power stays negative. So positive over negative is going to be negative infinity. Right? When you have a non-zero on top and a zero on the bottom, it just depends on what your overall sign is. Our overall sign is negative, so we're getting negatively infinitely large. In his, in his solutions here, he writes that you have a non-zero over zero, so you know it has to be one of the two, and then he determines that the sign is negative, so he says you get negative infinity. Same idea.
Here's a fun question. What if we came from the other side? Would it still be negative or would it turn to positive? Who votes with a thumbs up for positive? Who votes with a thumbs down for negative? Right. It would be positive because the top is going to stay the same sign as it was. It's still going to be e to the eighth times negative six squared. But now the denominator is going to be slightly positive to an odd power is going to stay positive. So it would be the opposite. 2b. The limit as x approaches 4 from the right of x plus 3 times. Wow, look at that. So nice. He factored it for you. What a gentleman. Times x minus 4 over 2 minus the square root of x. Um, yeah. And then the kind of typical way of approaching this problem would be to, well, what am I? I'm about to skip something I shouldn't. I should first plug it in. I'm not going to actually write anything down, though, because I don't want to plug it in. On top, I'm going to get 4 minus 4, which is 0. On the bottom, I'm also going to get 2 minus 2, which is 0. So I know I have a 0 over 0 type. I know I need to do something else. But I should at least be checking for that. So then I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. 2 plus the square root of x on top and bottom. And as we've said numerous times, when you multiply a fraction by the conjugate of one of the things, you actually multiply out the conjugates, and you don't actually multiply out the things that are not conjugates. So here, the numerator is not going to get multiplied out. We're just going to leave it as x plus 3 times x minus 4 times 2 plus the square root of x. There's no reason to multiply any of, the, any of this out, because we know we want to cancel that x minus 4. And then the denominator, 2 minus root x and 2 plus root x is 4 minus 2 root x plus 2 root x, which cancel out. And then minus root x times positive root x is negative x. Hmm. I have an x minus 4. I have a 4 minus x. Those don't exactly cancel out. But if you divide them by each other, what do you get? Right. So I think it's perfectly fine to say like, oh yeah, this divided by that is going to equal negative one. This is going to be the limit as x approaches four from the right of x plus three times negative one times two plus the square root of x. And then we can just plug in four and get four plus three times negative one times two plus the square root of four, which ends up being what? Seven times negative one times four, which is negative 28. Interestingly, maybe it didn't matter that this was approaching four from the right or four from the left, right? We could have just as easily done this limit as x approaches four from the left and gotten the same answer. Interesting. I don't know if I like this personally, but that's okay. 2c, the limit as x approaches zero of sine of 7x over 12x. And what, well, again, zero over zero. What's been written in the solutions here is that if you got the limit of sine of ax over bx, the answer is a over b. I personally would choose to show more work than that. I don't, I know that's a rule that's true, but I might not remember that exactly. I would have chosen to do this problem as the limit as x approaches zero of sine of seven x over blank times blank over 12 x. And then I wish I had a, 7x right there, which means I need a 7x here to balance it out. So they haven't changed anything. But then x divided by x is just 712, or the, the x divided by x just is 1. So I end up with this 712 as a constant coming out in front. And I have the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 7x over the same 7x. And then we know that this is equal to 1. So the whole thing is equal to 7 twelfths times 1, which is 7 twelfths. I know it's a little more writing, but I feel like this really shows that you know what you're doing. But you probably didn't have to write all that. But it is true, right? I could replace, just as a point of interest, you could totally replace the 7 and the 12 with A and B and do the same sort of work. I can say the limit is x goes to zero of sine of ax over bx. 
just do the same work, replacing every seven with A and every 12 with B, and you get the limit as X goes to zero of sine of AX over AX times AX over BX. The X divided by X is just one. So then you have A over B times the limit as X goes to zero of sine of AX over AX. But we know that limit is one. We get A over B times one, which is A over B. So it's definitely true if A is seven. Cool. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. All right, I'm just going to keep going, but you really, really, really should ask questions if you have them. Not that you necessarily should have questions right now. I just, but like, as I look at your faces, I see this. I'm like, hmm. So if you if you have a question, it's really okay to ask it. Um, all right, moving on to three. Again, we can always go back to, if you, if you think of something, you're like, James, what was that about? You can go back. F of X equal nine X squared and... L is equal to the limit as X approaches one of F of X, which in this case should be what? If I let X go to one for this function, what value am I going to get? Right, which is the first question. So when someone says do something using any method, what they're telling you really is use the easiest method you know. Do the least amount of work you can to find this thing I'm asking you to find. The same with the derivative questions. It said use any method. That really meant don't do it the long way, right? They're, unless they specifically tell you to use the limit definition of the derivative, you should be using whatever shortcuts, rules, formulas you have. So here, when they say find the limit L using any method you want, it's just this limit, which is just the limit as X approaches one of nine X squared. And just like every other limit we've looked at, the first thing we should do is just try to plug in what x is approaching. And we can. We get 9 times 1 squared, which is not something divided by 0. So we just get 9. Nice. All right. Part B is a little more interesting. Find the interval of all x values for which the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. I think it's kind of funny he writes this and then writes when epsilon equals one. I guess I get it. Like he's trying to make sure you see like the definition part of the limit, but then he's like, and here's epsilon. So take this expression and rewrite it using the actual numbers we have. So instead of this minus that less than that, I'm gonna write the absolute value of my function, which is nine x squared minus the limit we just found, which is nine, less than epsilon, which we said is one. And then we're gonna try to get a compound inequality and isolate X. So whenever you have an absolute value less than a number, we immediately rewrite it as the stuff inside, less than that number and bigger than the opposite of that number. There's a couple ways you could go from here. You could straight away divide both sides by nine, but then you have to add fractions after that. So it's probably easier to add nine to everything first. Say eight is less than nine X squared is less than 10 and then divide everything by nine. So the eight over nine is less than X squared is less than 10 over nine. And then take the square root of everything. So that X is less than the square root of 10 over the square root of nine and bigger than the square root of eight over the square root of nine. I didn't write the square root of nine, I wrote three, but I'm really thinking about taking the square root of the top and the bottom. So that's our interval. X needs to be between these two numbers. I guess we could write it using interval notation. Our interval is the square root of eight over three to the square root of 10 over three. Okay. Now, part C, so it's to find maximum value of delta such that all values, oh my gosh, it's a lot of words here. All values of X satisfying zero less than the absolute value of X minus one less than delta are in the interval for part B. So I feel like the way he set this up, I, I think his answer is right, but I feel like the setup and the solutions here is a little bit, it seems a little bit wonky. I'm not going to lie. So we want 
Yeah, I feel like I yeah, mm, I don't love it. I'm trying to I'm trying to kind of I'm trying to reconcile how he's done it with how one should do it. So here's what I would here's what I would have done. I want this. I want the absolute value of x minus one less than delta. That's what I want, right? That's what he said, right? They said, and I guess technically greater than zero. Okay, I'm not too worried about that. So what I really want is x minus one to be between delta and negative delta. But usually I call the left one delta one, the right one delta two, because I know that they're different. He doesn't do that here, it's fine. I'm gonna do it here because I want to. And then I'm gonna try and make this inequality look like that inequality. So I'm gonna add one to everything to get X by itself. So one minus Delta one less than X less than one plus Delta two. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this left side of this inequality equal to this left side of this inequality. And similarly, this right side of this inequality equal to this right side of this inequality and then solve for delta. So doing that, look what I get. Root eight over three equal to one minus delta one, add delta one over here, subtract root eight over three over there. Or set one plus delta two equal to the square root of 10 over three, subtract one. So square root of 10 over three minus one. And then he says you don't have to actually identify which one's smaller. You can just say that your delta should be the minimum of those two. Which is exactly what he had on his answers. Um, the other way you could have gotten there if you wanted to, which I think is perfectly fine, which might even be easier. Mm, yeah, yeah, I kind of like that. If this is going to feel a little bit less nice, but I want to show it to you anyway. You could have taken, sorry, that looks super great. You could have taken this inequality here, the square root of eight over three, less than X, less than the square root of 10 over three, and tried to make it look like the absolute value of X minus one is less than the number. So then if I subtract one from everything, I get square root of eight over three minus one, less than X minus one, less than, square root of 10 over three minus one. And then if you take the absolute value, you can say that the absolute value of X minus one has to be less than this or this, but this is negative. So you have to take the absolute value of it too and get one minus the square root of eight over three. That feels a little less straightforward to me, but is the valid still. So, I think it's kind of neat actually. Basically you're saying, right, X minus one needs to be between this positive number and this negative number to take the absolute value of it. Well, the absolute value of this needs to be less than whatever this negative number is in absolute value. It'd be nice if these were nicer numbers, but not. Yeah. That's kind of all there is to say about that one. It's kind of, yeah, I, I feel like the way this solution here, I, I feel like this is actually not right. I don't feel like that's a correct thing to be writing, but that's okay. So then two lipsticks. Because we're not looking for that, right? We're looking for absolute value of x minus one to be less than delta. Right? That's not our delta. Our delta is that or that. So I feel like there's something wonky kind of going on here. I wouldn't also worry too much about it. Honestly. Let's look at. Yeah, this one, mm, sure, it's the paper, yeah, feels bad, but okay. Okay, number four. And then we'll wrap it up after five and talk about some inverse trig stuff and inverse functions. At time t greater than or equal to zero, we have the h of t is equal to t cubed minus five t squared plus 2t gives the position of a car in number of miles. So h of t equals this, miles, and t is measured in hours. And specifically miles east of the starting point. Okay. 
So let me ask everybody. If we plugged in the value for T and got a negative number, like for example, um, I was the first, I was about to be like, like if we want an H of one, which is what the first question asks, um, let's see what happens. So um, uh, I think he, okay, he he, give, he gives it all. I was gonna be like, what does it mean if you get a negative number? But it's literally spelled out here. In particular, when H of T is negative, this means the car is negative H of T miles west of its starting point. Oh, sure, yeah. It, yeah, whatever, the, yeah, the positive number west. Okay, so H of one is one minus five plus two, which is negative two. So the position is positive two or negative negative two miles west of the start, right? Negative, negative two. Okay. What is the speed of the car in miles per hour after exactly one hour has passed? How do we find speed? Or how do we find instantaneous velocity? I know they're not the same, but how do we find instantaneous velocity? And then, you know, we take the, right. And they were trying to find instantaneous, and someone says the word instantaneous, they mean the derivative. So instantaneous velocity, we're gonna find the derivative. So H prime, let's just find the derivative as a function of T first. A term of T, again, you don't have to do it the long way. We're just gonna use the power rule. We're going to get 3t squared minus 10t plus 2. And if we plug in 1, we're going to get 3 times 1 minus 10 times 1 plus 2, which is negative 7 plus 2, which is negative 5. Negative 5, what are my units here? Miles per hour, right? Because position was measured in miles. Time is measured in hours. So when you take the derivative, you're not just miles anymore, you're miles per unit of time. Now that's the velocity, which means we're traveling at five miles per hour in the negative direction. So we're going, I'm, I'm never good with directions here. Let's see, that is your right, which is east. So we're not going east, right? Because east is the positive direction. We're going west. We're going five miles per hour in the westward direction because we're going negative five miles per hour. But the answer to the actual question is that the speed is the absolute value of whatever your number is, is going to be positive five miles per hour. Speed doesn't care about which direction we're traveling in. It just cares that there is a magnitude. And then thirdly, when is the acceleration zero? So to find the formula for acceleration, we differentiate again. The derivative of position is velocity. The derivative of velocity is acceleration. So acceleration, which I would write as A of T, is the derivative of velocity, is the second derivative of position, and it's equal to the derivative of this. So that's going to be 6t minus 10. And they're asking, when is acceleration zero? So we're going to set that equal to zero. So set 6t minus 10 equal to zero. Solve for time. You get time equal to 6 times time equal to 10. Time equal to 10 sixths of an hour. Or you could change that to, oh, Seconds? How are you getting? Oh, hmm. Seconds. How are you getting seconds? I don't know if I agree with your answer here about seconds. I would maybe ask for clarification because, all right, we're measuring time in hours. So I think that should be 10 six of an hour which you could change to minutes if you really wanted to, because one sixth of an hour, how much is one sixth of an hour? How many minutes is one sixth of an hour? 10 minutes. So 10 sixths of an hour is 10, 10 minute intervals or a hundred minutes. I don't think we really need to make that change, but since the number is so nice, I kind of like it.
you might ask him about that if you care. Some people give extra credit for correcting their mistakes. I don't imagine that's the case. I'm certainly no promises there, but maybe like I think that's supposed to be ours. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm maybe I'm overlooking something that I'm not aware of. I don't think that's the case, but I don't actually. And then the bonus questions. The third bonus question looks interesting. Bonus question. True or false? Don't need to show work. You don't need to show work. Interesting. Okay. The function, if, so 5a, if f, if f is continuous, then it must be differentiable. And the answer is false. Can you think of a function that's an example of a, or can you think of a counterexample of a function that is continuous but not differentiable everywhere? There's one kind of favorite choice that everybody usually the absolute value function. That is, in my opinion, the go to example of a function that is certainly continuous everywhere. It defined everywhere, no breaks, but it's certainly not differentiable at the origin. You've got a sharp corner there. Sharp corners do not equate to differentiability. Don't want to be pointy. My other favorite example is f of x equal to x to the two thirds. Again, differentiable, or sorry, continuous everywhere, but has a cusp at the origin, sharp point. All right, let's look at 5b. If g is a function such that g of one equals negative one and g of two equals two, there must be an x such that g of x equals zero. And that is also false. Let's see why. So if g of one equals negative one, Maybe it looks like this. G of two equals two. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe that's all the functions defined to be at all. No one said the function was defined everywhere. No one said the function was continuous everywhere. You could really be like, there's nowhere else the function is defined. Now that's, I, I feel like he might have meant more that the function is also defined everywhere, but we're still missing the important requirement that g of x is continuous to be able to make sure that it crosses whatever value specifically y equals zero that we want. So you might have something that looks like this. It might kind of go like this, and then it might jump like that so that the function never equals zero because it is discontinuous. Yeah, that's why this one's also false. Usually, if people are asking true or false questions, it's usually easier to ask a question where the answer is false because it's easier for people to figure out how something is false. Whereas figuring out something is true means you kind of have to prove it to yourself in some sense. So it's usually easier to find a counterexample to something than to find, than to be like, well, yeah, it's true all the time for every possible situation. So something to be aware of next time, right? If you have true or false questions, now, they're going to be false for sure, but you might start on the side of, well, this might be false. How could I maybe show that there's a counterexample to what we're saying here? And then the third one here, this third one's wacky. If I have C, find a pair of polynomials. So find P of X and G of X. Sorry, Q of X, apologies. Sometimes those Qs look like Gs. Such that both of the following are true. One, P of X divided by Q of X has one horizontal asymptote and one vertical asymptote. And those asymptotes 
cross at the point one comma three. Wow, can I spell? Not really. Asymptotes. This tells us what the asymptote should be. The vertical asymptote has to be x equal to one. The horizontal asymptote has to be y equal to three. Otherwise they couldn't cross at that point. So then, oh, and, and then also we want that P of one is equal to zero and Q of negative one is equal to zero. So that means P of X must have X minus one as a factor. And Q of X has X plus one as a factor or X minus minus one if you want to think of it that way. Okay, let's start writing out the rational function and see if we can make it work. So we're gonna have P of X over Q of X. We know that P of X has to have an X minus one as a factor and Q of X has to have an X plus one. We also know that we need a vertical asymptote of X equal to positive one, which means we need an X minus one in the denominator. That's actually not enough because currently with the X minus one in the numerator, those will cancel out and you won't actually have a vertical asymptote. So we actually need another factor of X minus one so that when you cancel out, there's still an X minus one in the denominator, which gives you a vertical asymptote. In a similar way, the X plus one in the denominator is problematic because if we look at this expression as is, we have a vertical asymptote at negative one. And the problem said specifically, we, only, we want exactly one horizontal asymptote and exactly one vertical asymptote. So we need at least one factor of X plus one up here to cancel the X plus one on the bottom so that we don't get a vertical asymptote there. But now we need a horizontal asymptote of Y equals three and to have a horizontal asymptote that's a non-zero constant, we have to have the degree on top and the degree on the bottom being the same. Now, to my mind, it feels like you could probably toss in any factor of X you wanted. I he likes to put another x plus one squared here, but I think you could just as easily put in any factor you like that's not one of these things already. Like, how about an x minus five? With this as my function, currently the words I'm looking for are horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptote would be y equal to one. Because the degree on top is x to the third, the degree on the bottom is x to the third. And if you multiply it out, I'm not going to multiply it out. If you multiply it out, you'd have x to the third plus lesser terms over x to the third plus lesser terms. But I want the horizontal asymptote to be what? Right, three. So what do I do? I multiply the top by three. So that now the horizontal asymptote is three. I will point out, technically he didn't answer the question in the solutions. The question didn't say find the rational function. The question said, find P of X and Q of X. So if you wanted to be 100% correct here, you would then be like, okay, P of X is three times X minus one times X plus one times X minus five. And Q of X is X plus one times X minus one squared. I mean, certainly anyone reading the problem can see that that's what he meant, but it's good to answer the question that's actually being asked. Yeah, that's kind of a funky question, I'm not gonna lie. It's, it's, a little, it's a little weird. Any questions about the questions? Okay. It seemed like a fair test, challenging, not too long, but not too short. 
Certainly in the realm of reasonable, I think. Certainly, I think not too different from his actual exam or from his practice exam, right? Like the, the format was very similar. The questions weren't exactly the same, but not so dissimilar that there was anything that felt unexpected, I think. So for your next exam, do you, you guys have a second exam? Just the final, but still for the final, you should certainly look at his actual practice final, which I imagine, right? I can't imagine it will be very different from the actual final, right? Similar in content, similar in length, maybe some questions that are not exactly the same, but same ideas, same concepts. So definitely use the practice final as a guide because it's going to be a good one. All right, let's go ahead and continue on. I think the last time we had just started talking about I think I did a very, very quick example of the derivative of an inverse trig function. I think, yeah, but it was like super quick. So I'm trying to get things back in order here. One second. Oh my gosh, I'll fix it. All right, anyway. Sorry, everything's all over the place. All over the place. I think, I think we're back in order. So inverse trig functions, inverse functions in general, When you hear the expression inverse function, what you should think of is a function that undoes what the other function just did. So for very generalized, if y equals f of x, then the inverse is literally x equals f of y. You interchange X and Y. The input becomes the output, the output becomes the input. But then we don't usually leave it like that. We then go ahead and solve for Y. Then solve and get Y equal to F inverse of X. But the real kind of key thing here is that you're actually interchanging the X and Y variables to interchange the nature of the relationship. So one example that's easy to kind of comprehend is y equal to the function 2x plus 3. Seems pretty not too terrible. This function takes your input x, doubles it, and then adds 3. And you know what the inverse function does? It undoes all those things. So in this example, we can actually just kind of talk out how the inverse is going to work. So if I want to undo first doubling a number and then adding three, I'm going to have to undo the things in the opposite order. So the inverse function, which we will derive, but also we'll just say, I'm going to take my input and to undo the addition of three, I'm going to first subtract three. And then from all that, I'm then going to undo the doubling by dividing by two. Now, it's not always that easy to just figure out what the inverse is, but sometimes it is. And when it is, it's like, oh, yeah, we're just undoing what the other thing did. For, and then to kind of say, with to give a numerical example, f of 7 is 2 times 7 plus 3, which is 14 plus 3, which is 17. So the function f takes an input of 7 and gives you an output of 17. And the inverse should undo that relationship. It should take the output of 17, use it as the input, and then deliver 7 as the output. Let's see. F inverse of 17 is 17 minus 3 divided by 2, which is 14 divided by 2, which is 7. These are inverses. Let's talk a little bit more. The way you would find the inverse, so to find F inverse of x, what we would do is we would take our original function, y equal to 2x plus 3. We would switch x and y. Technically, you could stop there. x equal to 2y plus 3 is the inverse relationship. But since we like writing our functions as functions of x, right? that's the easiest way for us to kind of visualize graphing them, we typically go the extra mile 
and solve for y. x minus 3 equals 2y. x minus 3 divided by 2 is equal to y. Oh, yeah, there's your inverse function. Another very common example of inverse functions is our e to the x and natural log of x, or really any exponential function and the log with the same base. So, for example, e to the x, and I should really write, yeah, f of x equal to e to the x, and g of x equal to the natural log of x are inverses, are inverse functions as are 2 to the x and log base 2 of x, or really any exponential function and the logarithm with the same base. And inverse functions have a lot of special properties. One of the most important ones being that when you compose inverse functions with each other, they undo each other and you get back to the thing you started with. So if I look here, right, if I did like, for example, in this previous example here, if I found what like, uh, sorry, brain, um, f inverse of f of seven, f of seven would have given me 17 and then f inverse of 17 gets me back to seven. So when you do f inverse of f of something, you end up with that same something. And that's true here as well. Here, if f of x, sorry, if f of g of x, is e to the natural log of x. They undo each other and you get back to just the thing you originally input. And it doesn't matter if you compose them one way or the other way. g of f of x is also going to be equal to x. The natural log of e to the x is just x. So inverse functions undo each other. And Let's go through it. There are lots of functions we would like to have an inverse. Not every function has an inverse. There are lots of functions that are not invertible because they don't pass the horizontal line test. Just like functions have to pass the vertical line test. In fact, here's an example. Y equal to X squared. Doesn't pass the horizontal line test. And so when you switch X and Y, to try and find the inverse. When you switch x and y graphically, what happens? You flip the graph across the line y equals x. Or you can just think it, right? x equals y squared is not too hard to graph. It's a rightward opening parabola. Let me ask everybody. Is this thing a function? Definitely not. It fails the vertical line test very hard. And it's because its inverse relationship is failing the horizontal line test. This horizontal line, when I interchange X and Y, becomes a vertical line. So if your original function fails the horizontal line test, your inverse relationship won't be a function because it'll fail the vertical line test. Sometimes we care so much about a function that we say, well, we're going to fix it. This function we kind of care about enough that we say, well, let's just limit this to when x is greater than or equal to zero. So that the piece of it that we're looking at, so I'll try and like make thicker looking over here. The right-hand side of this, now the right-hand side on its own would pass the horizontal line test. And so when we reflect that, and get this top part up here, this top part does pass the vertical line test. And so if we continue on and we solve for y, normally square rooting both sides, we would get y equal to plus or minus the square root of x, but we only want the top part here, which is y equal to the positive square root of x. So some functions, even though originally they don't merit an inverse because they're not invertible because they fail the horizontal line test. Some functions we care about so much, they're like, well, we're going to reduce the domain or restrict the domain so that the part we have is invertible. And there's the inverse. 
And that's what we're doing with the trade functions. Every trade function is important. I mean, most functions are important, but every trade function we really care about. So every trade function, even though they're all not passing the horizontal line test, not a single one of them, right? They're all periodic. They eventually do the same thing over and over and over again. We're going to restrict all their domains so that they will be invertible. And then we're going to talk about them. So, whew, yeah, all right. And we might not get to graph all of them because there's a lot of them. But let's talk about the first two, sine and cosine. We'll start with sine first. So y equals sine of x looks like this. And you know we have a negative pi over 2, pi over 2, pi, et cetera. And notably, not invertible. If you try to interchange x and y and get x equal to sine of y, it's going to look like this. Zero, pi over two, pi. So there's my one comma pi over two, my zero comma pi, my negative one negative pi over two, zero negative pi, and so on. Just taking the same graph, except now instead of being on the x-axis, it's along the y-axis. And then, Somebody picked, somebody picked some domain for sine to restrict the function to. And the pick that seemed like the best choice, even though who knows if it was really the best choice, was to go from x equals negative pi over two to x equals pi over two. And take that section there and invert just that, which corresponds to just this little slice right here. Probably you can see the color differentiation there a little bit. You know, it's kind of hard to draw on black. So that little red bit there is y equal to the inverse sine of x, or as I usually prefer, y equal to the arc sine of x. They mean the same thing. They're just different notations for the same thing. So some interesting things to be aware of. Sine of pi over three, root three over two. In a similar way, the arc sine of root three over two is pi over three. Right, we're, we're inverting the relationship. If sine of something equals something, if sine of pi over three equals root three over two, then it exactly must be true that the arc sine of root three over two equals pi over three. Just like if two to the third is equal to eight, that's the same as log base two of eight having to equal three. We're interchanging the input and the output, the input and the output. Now, the thing about these inverse trig functions specifically is that things can be kind of weird. Sine of pi over three, pi over three isn't the only angle that gets you root three over two. It's also true that sine of two pi over three equals root three over two, or sine of seven pi over three equals root three over two. And even though there's a lot of different angles that you can take sine of to get positive root three over two, when you take arc sine of root three over two, you only get one angle out. Why? Because we want it to be a function. And functions have to work that way, where if you input one thing, you don't get out multiple things, right? We're not getting out. If I plug in root three over two, which is right here, everybody look for a second. If I root three over two is what, like about 0.8, maybe it's more like right here. If I go up, there's the pi over three value that I actually want. And then there's the two pi over three value that I don't actually want. Because I want it to be a function. I only want this red piece, none of the rest. Cool. So f of x equal to sine of x and f inverse of x 
equal to the arc sine of x. Again, here's the graph of the arc sine. It's not a very big graph, right? It's it's very limited in scope. Its domain is negative one to one. Its range is negative pi over two to pi over two. And it looks like this. And I know some people were asking me, I think last time about like sine of the arc sine and how that kind of works. Well, it mostly works like you would hope it to work. When you compose functions that are inverses, they usually undo each other. So usually, which way do I want to go first here? The, sure, sine of arc sine of x is equal to one, is equal to x, holy smokes, and the arc sine of the sine of x is equal to x. But that usually is pretty vague. So let's be a little bit more specific about it. First of all, for arc sine of x, the domain is really limited. It's negative one to one. And the range is also fairly limited. It's negative pi over two to pi over two. So in this first expression here, this first expression is actually always true, as long as it's defined. For example, sine of arc sine of say, I don't know, negative one half. Arc sine of negative one half is some angle. We'll say what it is in a second. And then sine of that angle should get you back to the value that gave you that angle in the first place. So it's totally gonna be sine of negative pi over six, because negative, if you take sine of negative pi over six, you do get negative one half. And that is the angle that's in the range. I want to point out arc sine of one half of negative one half is definitely not equal to, I don't know, seven pi over six or 11 pi over six or any other pi over six angle that would have a reference angle of pi over six. So you so you get a negative one half. It has to be that one. That's the only one. It's a function. And then the sine of that is negative one half. On the other hand, if someone said, what's sine of arc sine of three? You wouldn't let them trick you. You'd say that does not exist. Because the arc sine of three isn't a real thing. There is no angle that you take sine of to get three. The biggest sign can ever be is one. So this part here, arc sine of three equal to some angle that would be equivalent to sine of that angle equaling three. And that's a no-go. Sine can't be any larger than one. Can't be any more negative than negative one. No. Oh, I didn't say kind of maybe the most important thing about this. In my opinion, there's lots of important things. When I say arc sine of, which haven't I picked yet, arc sine of root two over two, that's what I say out loud. What I say in my head is the angle whose sine is that value. Emphasis on the angle. Arc sine of whatever is an angle. What angle, you might ask? The angle you take sine of to get that value. So in this case, arc sine of root two over two is the angle theta such that sine of theta is equal to root two over two. Okay, so what's the angle actually? What angle can we take sine of and get root two over two? Yes. And I'm glad you said pi over four and not 45 degrees, because in this context, our angles have to be measured in radians. Degrees are not an option here. You can use degrees and then change it to radians, but make sure your answers are in radians. Okay, 
here's where the other side of this gets a little bit weird. If someone said find like, hmm, where do you go here? The arc sine of sine of, what angle haven't I used yet? Mm, pi over six. Like, well, it's pi over six. They undo each other. Sine of pi over six is one half. Arc sine of one half is pi over six. But if your angle is outside of the range of the arc sine function, if your angle is bigger than pi over two or more negative than negative pi over two, then your angles are your answer is not going to be the same as the angle you started with. For example, if I said, what's the arc sine of sine of five pi over six? Well, funny fact, funny fact, fun fact, sine of pi over six and sine of five pi over six are actually the same. One of those angles is in quadrant one. One of those angles is in quadrant two. Both of those quadrants are where sine is positive. Both of those angles have the same reference angle. So both of them should have the same sine value. And they do. They're both equal to one half. And now here is where we see the functional part of the inverse trig function coming into play. Arc sine of one half better only be one thing. It can't be pi over six and five pi over six. That's not allowed if you're a function. So we're stuck has to be pi over six because we've all decided to agree that that's the case. In a similar way to how we've all de decided to agree that the square root of nine is three and not negative three. We could have all decided way back when that the square root of a number gave you the negative root instead of the positive one. But we all mathematics said we want it to be a function and this is the piece of the function we're gonna pick. But at some juncture, someone was like, and I mean, the, the square runs a little less like ambiguous. Like, like, of course, you would pick the positive one, not the negative one, but still, like, someone made a choice once upon a time. Maybe they didn't know they were making a choice. Though. All this to say, we can do some fun stuff with this. Like, we can take some derivatives. Also, looking at this function for a second, the derivative is not going to have a whole lot of domain, right? The derivative can only be defined wherever the function was defined in the first place because to be differentiable, the function has to have been continuous already. So at most, we're going to be differentiable from negative one to one. Although I think we're going to lose the endpoints because to me, it looks like the tangent line at one is looking like it might be very, very vertical. And if your tangent line's vertical, it means your slope's undefined, which means your derivative's undefined. Well, let's find out. So we have y equal to the arc sine of x. And we want to find the derivative. And this is where we're going to use all the implicit and chainable stuff we've been doing for a while now. Typically, typically, I don't know. You're trying to get rid of the function you don't know how to differentiate. So in a similar way, I think it was last time when we were doing like find, for example, like I wanted to find the derivative of X to the cosine of X. And I didn't know how to do that. So I did something to manipulate it, to get it into a format that I knew how to differentiate. In this case, which is not what we're gonna do here, but in this case, I took the natural log of both sides and got the natural log of X to the cosine X. And I brought the cosine down and bringing the cosine down out of the exponent allowed me to rewrite the right-hand side as a function that I knew how to differentiate using the product rule in the chain. Same deal here. I want to rewrite this expression in a way that it's using functions that I already know how to differentiate. So you can either think of taking the sine of both sides Or you can just say to yourself, well, we're undoing the thing we originally did. Y equal to arc sine of X came from X equal to arc, X equal to sine of Y. Now, technically there's a caveat here. That angle X, sorry, that value X, right? That value X has to be between negative one and one. More importantly, that angle Y, Y has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. It doesn't really end up mattering. And if you kind of forgot about that for the derivative, you'd be fine. But it is something we do mention. Actually, we're going to use it as well. Look, 
Now we've written this in a way that we know how to differentiate both sides of this expression. Let me ask everybody real quick. I know it's been a minute. What's the derivative of sine of x? Thanks. What's the derivative of sine of some stuff? Cosine of times. Thank you. That's all I wanted to hear. So the derivative of sine of some stuff is going to be cosine of your stuff times the derivative of your stuff. Equal to, on the other side, the derivative of x is 1. Now we're going to solve for dy dx. So dy dx is going to equal 1 divided by cosine of y. Yes, you could write this as secant of y. You should not write it as secant of y. More importantly, we don't want to leave our answer in terms of y. We want to leave it in terms of x. Now, here is an answer that's correct, but not right. If you write this, people are going to know that you're correct. And also, they're going to be like, well, that's not as right as it could be. It is technically correct to say that dy dx is equal to 1 over cosine of arc sine of x. Most people will say when they ask you to find these derivatives, don't write your answer in terms of any trig functions. There should be no trig functions left in your answer. What we really should do here is one of two things. My personal favorite, also because it's going to come back in 21b when you talk about trig substitution, is to draw the triangle. So I'm going to remind you all that sine of y equal to x means sine of my angle y equals x over 1. So drawing a little triangle, a little right triangle, sine of my angle y is the opposite over the hypotenuse. And then I can find the third side using the Pythagorean theorem. It's going to end up being the square root of 1 minus x squared. You could call it a, and then a squared plus x squared equals 1, and you can solve for a. And then... If I look here, my derivative dy dx is going to equal 1 over cosine of y. Cosine of y is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is just the square root of 1 minus x squared. Alternatively, if you don't love this, that's fine. Although you should love this. Is, this is the best way to do it. But if you really, really want, you could also use the trig identity and say sine squared of y plus cosine squared of y is equal to 1, and solve for cosine. Cosine squared of y is equal to 1 minus sine squared of y. Cosine of y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 minus sine squared of y. But sine of y is equal to x. So cosine of y is really equal to, we'll, we'll deal with the plus or minus in a second here, the square root of 1 minus x squared, which is exactly what's going right there. That's our cosine of y. So you could do it with a trig identity, or you could do it with a triangle. It's really the same work, just presented a different way. I strongly recommend getting comfortable using the triangle. Not that you're really going to be using it. Like once we do these derivatives, you kind of just then start remembering them or memorizing them. Um, but what I'll say about this is that the triangle definitely does come back for trig substitution in 21 b What about this plus or minus? Well, let me remind everybody. Our angle is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. What quadrants could my angle be in if it's between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2? Let's see. Pi over 2 gets me all the way up to right there. Negative pi over 2, I have to go back down there. What quadrants am I in, potentially? 1 and 4. And you know what's true about those quadrants? Cosine of an angle in quadrant 1 is positive. Cosine of an angle in quadrant 4, also positive. So no matter where this angle lives, cosine of it has to be positive. So we just get the positive square root. So that's why it works out just fine. And that kind of thing works out for all of the rest of the trig, the inverse trig function derivative. So it's kind of lovely. It all works out so great.
All right. That said, there's still how many other trig functions to deal with? Five of them? Ugh. All right. So let's look at the rest of them. Well, as many as we can in the next eight minutes. So I'm going to kind of eschew the graphs for now because I want you to see the derivatives. And I really want you to see the fact that cosine actually works out just as nicely as sine. I should say inverse cosine and inverse sine have very, very similar derivatives. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say we have, mm, I feel like I owe you one last, I feel like I didn't, I feel like I would like to finish this off here. Let me write one more thing over here. Let me write it over here. Fine, fine, fine. So just as a finishing, the derivative of the arc sine of x is one over the square root of one minus x squared. Let's say we had the arc cosine of x, which looks very similar to the arc sine. I'll give you a quick little graph of it just because it's nice. So there's the graph of arc cosine. It's the segment of cosine that's in that's between zero and pi. And it's that segment of cosine flipped. So now instead of the domain being zero to pi and the range being negative one to one, the range is zero to pi and the domain is negative one to one. If I want to find the derivative, I'm going to do the same thing. To find the derivative of the arc cosine of x, we're going to start with y equal to the arc cosine, and then immediately rewrite it as cosine of y equal to x. This process gets to be very much the same every time for these inverse trig functions. We differentiate both sides. We get negative sine of our stuff times the derivative of our stuff. Oops, I forgot to plug in my... Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, safe, okay. Um, derivative of x is one. Solving for dy dx here, dy dx is equal to one over negative sine or negative one over sine of y. And then we employ the same sort of triangle thing we did last time. We take cosine of y equal to x. We rewrite that as your trig function equal to the right-hand thing, but write it as a fraction. So equal to x over 1. Draw your triangle. There's my angle y. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. We could actually do the work to find the third side x squared plus z squared equals one squared, z squared equals one minus x squared, z equals the square root of one minus x squared. Technically plus or minus, but again, we're not gonna run any issues because our cosine values are between, sorry, our arc cosine values are between zero and pi. We're in quadrants one and two, and sine is positive in quadrant one and positive in quadrant two. So again, we get to just grab the positive root. We don't have to worry about the negative root. And then if you look here, sine of y is exactly equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the derivative, let's write it up here. The derivative of the arc cosine of x is negative one over the square root of one minus x squared. How wonderful is that? It's especially wonderful because every pair of inverse trig functions, inverse sine and inverse cosine, inverse tangent and inverse cotangent, inverse secant and inverse cosecant, have this relationship where the derivative of the not co one, inverse sine, inverse tangent, inverse secant, is something, and then the derivative of the inverse co function is the same something but negative. Also repeating that pattern of all the regular trig functions, 
the co-functions, cosine, cosecant, cotangent, having negative derivatives. How wonderful is that? I think it's pretty great. Um, I also think it's pretty terrible that we're going to run out of time. But I always run out of time, so what's new? Let's look at two more examples. Sure. I feel like, I, I feel like I'm really kind of running through this time. There's only so much time. So let's look at y equal to the arc tangent of x. Graphically looks like this, taking one period of tangent from negative pi over two to pi over two and flipping it. So now the range is from negative pi over two, not included, to pi over two, not included. And it looks like tangent flipped on its side. Oops, except we go through the origin games. Kind of a lovely graph. Um, actually an important graph because later on, probably in 21B, someone's gonna ask you, hey, what's the limit as X goes to infinity of the arc tangent of X? And you're gonna need to remember the graph because there's no other really nice way to think about it. Like, oh yeah. If X is getting really, really big, the Y values are getting closer and closer and closer to pi over two. Kind of weird, kind of neat. If you wanted to find the derivative of this, we would do the same thing we just did again. We would say, all right, well, take tangent of both sides. Tangent of Y is equal to X. The derivative of tangent of some stuff is secant squared of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, the derivative of x is once again one, solve for y prime. y prime is one over secant squared of y. You might write that as cosine squared. I probably wouldn't. And then you go, you draw your triangle, tangent of y equals x over one equals opposite over adjacent. There's my angle y, opposite is x, adjacent is one. The third side is the square root of one plus x squared. And I never remember what secant is. Secant is like impossible for me. I know that cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So secant of y is going to be the square root of one plus x squared. So here y prime is going to be one over secant of y squared, which is just one over one plus x squared. And that's the derivative of the arc tangent of x. And based on what I said a minute ago, all of you already know what the derivative of the arc tangent is. It's super nice. If you know the derivative of arc tangent is one over one plus x squared, you get to automatically know that the derivative of the arc cotangent of x is negative one over one plus x squared. The last two, mm, we'll save for next time. So let me ask you one question though. Have either of your teachers talked about specifically the derivative of the inverse secant or the inverse cosecant? Okay. Have they talked about these other ones though? Arc tangent, arc sine. Who, which teacher has talked about them? Is it McDonough or is it Yonko? McDonough mm -hmm. hasn't, but Grofner has. Okay. Has he talked about secant, cosecant? Okay. Okay. Yeah. There, there's a weird issue with secant and cosecant in that there is not consensus as to which way we should define the inverse secant and the inverse cosecant. Some people do it one way and they get a derivative one way. Some people do it a different way and they get a slightly different derivative a different way. And one of them is a nicer choice based on the domain, and one of them is a nicer choice based on how the derivative looks. And it's kind of like, well, you could do it either way. So we might we might talk about that briefly, but if Grover is saying don't worry about it, and the other professor hasn't gotten there yet, we'll wait on. All right, I'll see you all on Thursday.